there's a very clear difference between a clean fast, what's happening during a fast that's only water, and what's happening with a fast that has roosters crowing, or is a dirty fast, okay, where you're having small amounts of calories. Okay, so a dirty fast, it doesn't take much to end up in a dirty fast, but don't let the name fool you. A dirty fast isn't this, this terrible thing. It doesn't mean that your results are dirty or that it's not working. It's just called a dirty fast because a clean fast is just water. It's just all there is to it, so it's in essence clean. A dirty fast is maybe you're having some creamer in your coffee, or maybe a dirty fast is you're having a Diet Coke, or you're having just one or two calories. And generally, along the world of the internet, they say like a dirty fast is having five or so calories. Anything more than five or 10 calories breaks your fast, but anything under 10 calories is essentially allowed with a dirty fast. When you look at the data, you look at the research, you look at what the scientific community says as far as mTOR and AMPK goes, which I'll explain in a second, unfortunately that stuff does break a fast, but there's some nuancey stuff with it. So let's go ahead and break it down because a clean fast is very clear and defined fasting. A dirty fast is arguably severe extreme caloric restriction. And there's quite a bit of data that describes the differences between fasting and caloric restriction. A lot of times fasting does imply caloric restriction because with fasting, a lot of times people do end up eating less on a fasting regimen. So yeah, they lose weight via caloric restriction. But a typical caloric restrictive diet is different. Now there's a lot of documented evidence on the success of a long-term caloric restriction diet when it comes down to longevity and all kinds of benefits. That is good. But with fasting, it's two different breeds altogether. You see, there's processes that we are trying to activate and processes in the body that we are trying to even inhibit by fasting. When we consume any food whatsoever, those processes or that we're trying to activate will stop or those processes that we're trying to inhibit might be allowed to go forward because all it takes is a couple of calories. So let's start with autophagy, which is something that's talked about a lot, sometimes overblown in the world of fasting, but autophagy is essentially the cellular recycling kind of survival of the fittest aspect of your cells. When you're fasting and you're not eating, they start breaking down components of themselves and different proteins for fuel for the cells. Well, this is largely driven by AMPK and mTOR. Okay, so it's the relationship between AMPK and mTOR that really makes this possible. mTOR is the growth response, the anabolic signal. When mTOR is activated, essentially, at least at the mTOR C1 level, global mTOR, you are not fasted, for lack of a better way of saying it. When AMPK is elevated, you are essentially fasting. But to make it simple, autophagy is on one side of the world, mTOR is on the other side. Okay, they are the complete opposites for all intents and purposes. Now what happens is AMPK is what is called an energy sensor. So when we are fasting, this AMPK senses or it has sensed that we are not eating and that our energy demand, okay, let me back up and say this slow, our energy demand is greater than our energy on hand. So if our demand for energy is greater than the energy we have available, AMPK elevates. The more that AMPK elevates, the better the chance of us activating autophagy, okay? So think of it like a series of dominoes, okay? And if you knock over the dominoes, you achieve the ultimate holy grail, the promised land of autophagy. So you have to knock over the dominoes, doom, boom, 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 boom. At the end, autophagy, you made it. mTOR, when you spike mTOR by consuming even one calorie, Essentially what that does is it pulls out, there's something called ULK1, okay? Uh, ULK, there's lots of different forms of ULK, but essentially it pulls a domino out. So now you're trying to activate autophagy, but mTOR has removed a domino. So boom, 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 boom. Uh-oh, you never got to activate autophagy because mTOR pulled out one of the dominoes. See how this is a problem. Now when AMPK is activated, that sort of makes it so that ULK cannot remove that domino. So now you don't have that pesky ULK removing the domino. So the more that AMPK is activated, the more that that domino chain can activate autophagy. But even better yet, the more that AMPK is activated, meaning the deeper that you are in a fast without having any calories, the deeper that you are in that fast, AMPK knocks over more dominoes, faster and faster. It's like a hyperactive kid. It's like knocking over more dominoes, more dominoes. So you're activating autophagy to the nth degree. Again, if you have one single calorie, technically 
it pulls out that domino. Here's the thing, the consensus within the scientific community, okay, full disclaimer, this is the consensus within the scientific community. It doesn't mean it's 100% fact. Any kind of calorie or nutrient is detected. Okay, our bodies are finely tuned mechanisms. So AMPK, mTOR are influenced by even just the smallest amount of calories. So that means any energy that you take in will inhibit the effects of the fast until you are fasted again. The operative words, until you are fasted again. So that begs the question, if I'm 20 hours into a fast right now and I have five calories, that five calories kicked me out of a fast until I'm fasted again. So how long does it take me to burn through those five calories? Is it one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Okay, it all varies bioindividually. Every person is different. The other thing is we don't know if we break that fast and then we get back into a fasted state, do the results sort of pick up where they left off or are we starting over from the beginning again? Meaning if I have five calories at 20 hours into a fast, when I burn through those five calories, did I just reset back to, back to zero? That's what we don't know. So maybe you pick up where you left off, maybe you restart. Anyway, there's more that we need to break down for this, okay? Specifically with fat loss and inflammation. Now there was a study that was published in Vitamin and Nutrient Research that took a look at alternate day fasting versus caloric restriction. Now the reason I mention this is because it's about as close as we can get to a dirty fast and it's not 100% applicable, but it still kind of works for the context of this video. With the alternate day fasting group, they had them fast every other day and they had them consume 400 to 600 calories between the hours of 12 and 2 p.m., okay? The, uh, and they did this for four months. The other group did a 25% caloric restriction diet every day. They just reduced their calories to 25% of their normal intake, very low calorie for four months every day. Now the fasting group on the days they weren't fasting, they were able to eat ad libitum, whatever they wanted, however much they wanted to. Pretty cool, right? They just had to fast strictly in a two hour eating window on the fasting days. Well, guess what? At the end of the four months, the alternate day fasting group lost five pounds more total weight they lost two and a half pounds more total fat mass, and they had lower C-reactive protein inflammatory marker levels. Okay, so the alternate day fasting group definitely exceeded that. Why do I mention this? Because it's about as close as we can get. A strict fasting group that was fasting for 22 hours every other day ended up exceeding a group that was in a dramatically reduced caloric restriction. And I say this because if you are dirty fasting in a really bad way, meaning I know a lot of people personally, you might too, that say they're fasting, but they're drinking like bulletproof coffee, they're, meaning they're adding like butter and cream to their coffee because they're saying, oh, well, it, it, there's no carbs, I'm not spiking my insulin, but they're still having 300, 400, 500 calories a day, legit. It may sound crazy to you, but a lot of people do that. And that is in essence, putting yourself just in caloric restriction. So look at the difference between caloric restriction in that group, which is still reducing calories and still very good, don't get me wrong, still very good to reduce calories. Compare that to intermittent fasting that was done strictly very clean. Clearly there was a difference there, okay? Now there's things that you can consume that I'm okay with during a fast. Green tea, black tea, black coffee, things like that because the one, maybe one or two calories you get from those things actually have a net positive effect because of the caffeine and because of some of the polyphenol effect. So those kinds of things are okay. okay there's all kinds of different things that are zero calorie, like stevia, monk fruit, that you're probably okay to have during a fast. I did put a link down below for Thrive Market. Uh, they're an online grocery store. who They sponsor a lot of content on this channel. The reason that I mention them is because if you're looking for like foods to eat during your fast, or, or excuse me, drinks you can have during your fast, but also things you can eat after your fast. Before I go a whole lot further with this, okay, what you eat outside of your fast doesn't constitute a dirty fast. I personally don't care if you wanna go eat a bunch of cheeseburgers or if you wanna go eat a nice salad, okay? I talk about specific strategies, but I will say it's important to try to keep it clean and close to the earth. Do what you can there. So shop appropriately, get the right groceries, do that, stock yourselves up so that you're setting yourself up for success. Uh, I did put a link if you wanna save 25% off your entire grocery order through Thrive Market. There's a link down below. Thrive Market is an online grocery store that specializes in better for you foods. So I've even helped them figure out what foods to put on their digital shelves, so to speak. So there's really a lot of uh, synergy between what I talk about and what Thrive Market does, but it's literally a grocery store. So you go online, you can sort by different diet types, 
it's grocery shopping, but it's done online in a category that has already done the vetting for you as far as foods that are better for you options. And then it just gets delivered to your doorstep in a couple of days, super easy. But I think the best part of getting it through me is that's a 25% off discount link for your entire first grocery order, plus a free gift. So they make it so unbelievably easy. Plus you can just organize by diet type, like paleo, keto, vegan. It just, I don't know, it just makes it easy, takes the headache out of it, takes the time out of it. So that link is down below and a big thank you to them for the continued support on this channel as well. Now the things you're wondering about. Artificial sweeteners, Diet Coke, stuff like that. Does that constitute a dirty fast? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. And we have to get nuancy again with it. Okay. So if we look at the data, it's kind of intriguing. With fasting, there was a study that was published in Medicine in Microecology. It took a look at a very positive impact of water fasting on the gut bacteria. In this particular case, Fusobacterium, which has actually been associated with uh, colorectal cancer. So it had a reduction in fusobacterium. So a reduction in that could be correlated with some pretty positive health benefits. Now I'm not saying fasting is going to do that, but the point is, is that in this study they saw a reduction there. But there is some more evidence uh, in a study that was done on subjects that were going through 30 days of Ramadan. Okay, this study was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, and they found that when subjects fasted for 30 days, intermittent fasting, so they allocated nutrients to different times of the day, of course, they found that there was an increase in gut diversity, but also an increase in prevalence in certain strains of bacteria that were more butyrate producing. These are just good bacteria, essentially bacteria we really want in our lives when it comes down to uh, producing more short chain fatty acids. So we know fasting does have a net positive impact on the gut. So then we have to ask ourselves the question, okay, we look at these rodent model studies, mouse and rat studies with artificial sweeteners, and it's kind of common knowledge out there on the internet that these rodent model studies exist, and people talk about it. Okay, are artificial sweeteners bad for the gut? In rodents, in high amounts, and high concentrations, clearly they are. There's negative impacts with saccharin, with sucralose, kind of with aspartame, but it's up in the air. Point is, is those are concentrated heavy amounts in rodents. So we can't directly translate that to humans. We haven't been able to see if there's an effect on gut bacteria in humans, so I can't speak to that directly. But we do know within rodents there's a huge effect, so it's arguable there's probably a small effect in humans. Although I can't say with certainty, to be completely frank with you. So if we're assuming that there is a small effect, then why would we want to negatively impact the positive effects of a fast? We're having positive impacts which we know exist as a result of fasting, so why do we want to throw a wild card in there? Now, saccharin and sucralose are the ones that are demonized the most because the rodent model research is there. If anything, as much as I hate to say it, I'm not a fan of aspartame, but if your cleanest, cleanest option is probably stevia or going to be possibly, in this case, uh, aspartame, which again, we don't really want to have, but if you're going to have to have something during a fast, that might be the best way to go. Now, the other piece that we do have to look at is what's called the cephalic insulin response. Insulin is pro-growth. Insulin triggers, remember that mTOR that I talked about. Now there's some very confusing research out there and it's very inconclusive that different artificial sweeteners might elicit a cephalic insulin response, meaning because we're consuming something sweet, the body in sort of a preemptive measure starts to secrete insulin because it registers something sweet. So it says, oh, sugar is coming. Let's go ahead and increase insulin production. I think that this is probably more likely to occur in someone that has been consuming a lot of sugar and then all of a sudden switches to a diet soda because the body is getting accustomed to that. If you're used to drinking diet soda, it probably doesn't happen as much, which is probably why there's so much inconclusiveness in all the data. But the question is, if it's a 50-50 shot, which seems like kind of what it is, is it a risk you want to take by breaking an entire fast by having a diet coke? Like, if it's not that hard for you, then don't have it, right? So then we need to look at the next piece, which is, again, couples on with this, which is insulin dynamics. Anytime we have a spike in insulin, and that means consuming protein, that means consuming a vegetable, that means consuming three calories, we have a spike in insulin, okay? Even with a little bit of fat, we can have a spike in insulin. Insulin is going to disrupt the dynamics because insulin is going to slow down the work that is done by what's called hormone-sensitive lipase. Hormone-sensitive lipase is what allows a fatty acid to break out of its triglyceride form, okay? And so basically, fat is stored in a triglyceride form in our body, and it gets liberated into a fatty acid and a glycerol back, or three fatty acids and a glycerol backbone. This is done by hormone sensitive lipase, which acts like a pair of scissors to kind of cut the triglyceride up. Insulin stands in the way of hormone sensitive lipase. So when you're fasting and you spike your insulin, you are effectively stopping fat loss for a short period of time. Remember, any insulin spike is going to have this, any insulin response. 
I want to clear some stuff up too surrounding what it is called uh, fasting mimicking. Okay. Now, Dr. Walter Longo had done some pretty cool research and he came up with this fasting mimicking diet. And it is absolutely awesome where he's taking foods that mimic a fast, but he is very clear on it too. These, this fasting mimicking diet is designed to get you some of the benefits of a fast. It's not literally designed to replace a fast and he's clear on that. Fasting is intense. Fasting gets you the arguably the best result and fasting is very significant caloric reduction. Fasting mimicking is designed saying, hey, let's get these foods that have the least negative impact. Let's get these foods in there that can still elicit some of the positive effects of a fast for people that don't want to fast or for just a longevity style diet that emulates some of the effects of fasting. What happens is people take this and they apply it into fasting. They say, well, Dr. Walter Longo says it's fasting mimicking so I can eat coconut oil during my fast and it's not going to break my fast. It will still break your fast. It's calories. It's still insulinogenic to a certain degree, but in a fasting mimicking setting, it's perfectly fine because that's what you're trying to do, but it still breaks a fast. Okay. So I wanted to clear that up just because it is fasting mimicking doesn't mean it's okay to have during a fast. It means it's got the least chance of breaking your fast, but it doesn't stop there. Okay. So what are some rules if you're watching this video and you still want a dirty fast? Well, dirty fast being like creamers in your coffee, sweet things, whatever. The main rule is have them as early on in your fast as you can. Like if you stop eating after dinner and you don't plan to eat again until dinner time the next day, when you wake up in the morning, have your coffee with some cream then and stop it then. Why? Because let's pretend for a second that that does stop the effects of your fast. Okay. Because we know that it does to a certain degree, but we don't know if it starts from zero or if it picks up where it left off. Assuming it starts from zero again, if you have those calories towards the early part of your fast, you have a better chance of at least still reaping the benefits of a fast later on. Okay. But if you start consistently having coffee with cream or decaf with cream throughout the course of your fast, you're disrupting the fast at multiple stages. You're better off to just have your coffee with cream and then go on without, without it for the rest of the day. But these, you know, I'm going to have a diet Coke now. I'm going to have a diet Coke then and you're consistently potentially disrupting the fast at least allocate the disruption of your fast to the beginning. So you still have time to get the rest of your fast to get the work done. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel and I'll see you tomorrow.